Friends, I want to say good morning to you all. Thank you for your presence this morning or any time you watch during the week. I'm coming to you live and in person from a hotel room somewhere in Waco, Texas. As we get started this day, today is the weekend we acknowledge Memorial Day. So let's start with a prayer and remind ourselves of what a great gift we have in this nation for all those who have gone before who have made it for it possible for us to have the freedoms that we share. So Lord, on this weekend that we acknowledge and recognize and remember all those who have given themselves on our behalf, on behalf of justice and righteousness, Lord, we just ask that you comfort those who still mourn, comfort those who are in harm's way, and help the rest of us to remember what was done for us. And Lord, when we think of those sacrifices, we're mindful of the sacrifice that you gave, that it's because of this love that gives itself that we have life, that we have hope, that we have freedom. And we ask that you guide this nation as we go forward. Help us to be mindful of you in a new way, even now, as we deal with the coronavirus, as we deal with the politics of trying to move forward. Lord, help us to call on you, to see who you are, to trust in you, and to give ourselves wholeheartedly to you in a new way. And we ask for your sovereign will to be accomplished in all of our lives and the lives of this nation. And again, thank you, Lord, for those who we remember this weekend and this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, welcome again. We are in experiment number whatever, trying to figure out how we're going to do this while we are in the stay-at-home order. We have some other unique glitches there in the sanctuary, but I thank everybody who's there who's trying to get things moving. The words may be an issue. We'll see how that works. We'll uh, be starting a hymn here in just a second. And God bless you. Our first hymn is Blessed Assurance. Unless I got that wrong, but you'll know in just a second, one way or the other. So I'll send it back to the sanctuary. God bless you. actually do a big hug. So, announcements this morning. First off, we start with um, the flowers on the altar, which are given in memorial um, for Paula Hess's dad, um, Kermit R. Hess. Um, and um, just a reminder, 
um, you can send your offering into the church office um, by snail mail. You can also just drop it by, but don't do it on Monday because Monday the office will be closed for Memorial Day. And, um, or you can, um, if you make arrangements with um, um, Diana, if you want to pay online um, with your credit card. So um, it's kind of a handy deal. Um, the other thing, we remember, need to remember that um, the Holy Spirit has been still showing up in the healing rooms on um, Thursdays. Um, so please uh, just email if you have a um, prayer request to ccf.healingrooms at gmail.com and they will uh, and <laughs> they will um, uh, get you to a um, uh, send you an email with a, a zoom link and you'll be able to um, get some real prayer because the Holy Spirit is there the same thing for the prayer request for today um, if you have any prayer requests today um, just get them to the get them to the committee that does all the prayer so um, if there are no other announcements I think um, Shaggy and, and Charlie have a message for the children with a couple other dudes. Hi, boys and girls. It is so good to be here. And you know what's great? It's so good that you can see us. We can't see you, but we can, but you can see us. Wait a minute. Oh, yes, yes, Charlie. Charlie wants me to let you know that Mr. Robinson and Shaggy are here to join us today. Come on over. Hi, boys and girls. Shaggy and I are really happy to be here. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Charlie wants me to know, wants me to figure out, is uh, Mr. Robinson the shaggiest or is Shaggy the dog the shaggiest? <laughs> Well, Charlie, that's, that's a really good question. You know, it's really not my fault that I'm getting so shaggy. My barber shop's been closed by, for two and a half months. And you know what? Pastor Riley and Pastor Jim have challenged me to a beard growing contest. And they, they've got a head start, but I'm catching up. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. Charlie wants to know. Can you step up here with us? All right. Charlie wants to know. Why are we dressed up like cowboys and cowgirls? Well, Charlie, that's a great question. And the reason is, in a moment, we're going to be singing a very famous song that the king of the cowboys, Roy Rogers and his wife, Dale Evans, who were movie and TV stars when Miss Janice and I were your age, we boys <laughs> and girls, and they were famous. Roy Rogers had a famous horse called Trigger, and Dale Evans had a horse called Buttermilk and Shaggy. They even had a dog named Bullet. <laughs> they were our heroes because we loved watching them chase the bad guys on their horses, and they were always trying to um, protect their neighbors and do the right thing for their friends, and yep, that's what they were always doing. <laughs> At the end of the show, what they did. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Mr. Robinson. At the end of the show, what they did was they would sing a very special song, their very own song. Mm -hmm. And they were not only famous for being a, a cowboy and a cowgirl, what they were really famous for in real life, they were devoted Christians. They wanted all their fans to know how much they loved Jesus and how important the Bible was to them. Mm hmm. So we're going to sing that song. The Bible tells me so. Yeah. And the and the song is about how the how God wants you to act like him and do what Jesus would do. And so the Bible tells you so. So I'm going to start it. OK. OK. It's good. OK. Here it goes. Have faith, hope and charity. That's the way to live successfully. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Now be real good to your enemies, and the blessed Lord you'll surely please. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just be real good today. The Lord is right beside you. He'll guide you all the way. You must have faith, hope, and charity. That's the way to live successfully. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. The Lord will take your 
your problems and work them out for you. But he wants you to love him and ride right through to you. You must have faith, hope, and charity. That's the way to live successfully. How do I know the Bible tells me? How do I know the Bible tells me? How do I know the Bible tells me so? Oh, that was a great song. Good job, guys. So God wants you to treat everyone the way his son Jesus would. So read the Bible, and if you can't read, please ask your mom and dad to read that for you so you'll know what God wants to do for you in your life. <laughs> and it's been so much fun being with you today. Shaggy and Charlie and Mr. Robinson and I, we're so looking forward to being with you again at church, okay? Oh, and one last thing, all you old buckaroos and you cowgirls, if you remember this song, why don't you sing along with us at home, okay? Okay. <laughs> Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds? We help each other. Just sing a song and bring the happy weather. Happy trails. And continuing on here, that was really fun, thank you. Beginning with Hosanna. This is a word that uh, many people have heard in the Christian world, and just for some of you who are new to worship, it really is a phrase that just means to save, to rescue, or savior. Thank you, Jesus, that we get to do this and praise you and open up our hearts and our minds. Yeah. 
all-timely favorite praise song called I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. Grace that taught my heart to fear. 
beloved. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom in this place with God. So join me as we pray together. Now's the time to lift our prayers to Him. So, Lord, we are so thankful for the freedom that you bring us. Lord, we're thankful for our nation. It is a nation of freedom. We thank you for the men and women who have gone before to preserve our freedom, God. Let us remember them this weekend, Lord. I ask that you bless them, God, with your most amazing, fulfilling blessings, Lord. Lord, I lift each one up out there that may need healing today. You, Jesus, are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So just touch, touch us, God. Bring healing to us, bring liberty to us, Lord. Bring the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace, love, forgiveness, long-suffering. Father, we love you. We're so thankful that you call us your people. We are the people of God. You call us to be salt and light. Lord, let us step into what you have for us. Let us step into the destinies that you've called each one of us to. And so, Father, today, just touch our hearts. Speak to us through Pastor Raleigh's sermon, Lord. Speak to us through the word. Father, we thank you. So pray with me, beloved. Let's pray. Let's uh, just pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As you, help me, you guys. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I forgot one announcement. Um, I wait, forgot wait. to tell no, you no, that. It's not on. Shouldn't have turned it off. Let me get it. Let me get it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for God's grace for all the mistakes. <laughs> um, I, I forgot one announcement before, and I'll read the scripture in just a minute. But um, I forgot the announcement that on Mondays uh, evenings at 6:30, we've been having a Zoom meeting for the last couple of weeks to talk about the scripture and also to talk about. Um, the um, questions that go with it that Pastor Riley has so diligently pro provided for us. So if you're interested in being part of that Zoom meeting, um, please give me a call or um, give me an email and I will um, um, give you the link and you can join in. It's kind of nice to see each other's faces. And even if you haven't really studied them very much, and uh, we can always have something to say, I'm sure. We, it's it's a, kind of a the women's group that was meeting on, on Tuesdays is now meeting on Mondays, and everyone's invited to the Zoom meeting, and um, please come. And even if you haven't done the homework, it's okay. That's our policy. So um, you always have something to add to it. So please join us. Um, all right. Pastor Wiley went to town with a scripture this week, so um, there are four of them. Um, get your tabs ready. Um, Luke 24, Acts 1, 1 Peter 4, and 5. So just so you'll be prepared, um, get those tabs ready. So here we go. Luke 24, 44 through 53. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness, and suffer and rise in the, I'm sorry. This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead uh, on the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning to, uh, in, at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out into the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them 
and was taken up into heaven. Then he worshipped him, and, and then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Then moving on to Acts 1, 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them a, this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then, he, then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who, was taken, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And moving on to 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives if for, human, for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join with them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse upon you. But they will have to give account to him who is already who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober, of a sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength of God, strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. To the elders among you, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. We've gone over, I'm sorry, we've gone to chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 14. Um, let me repeat that. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. 
Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flocks. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God op opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testing and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. May God help us to open our eyes to the understanding of his word. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, team. I appreciate everybody there. And I appreciate Bernice and Jorge and Diane figuring out how to get me from here to you there. Last week when I was ex thanking everybody, I left one person out. So Sharon, thank you for keeping us all together, both with the bulletin that you sent me and the bulletin that you got in there. Last week, she was in the house just in case, making sure like a good stage manager. So thanks, Sharon. So today's lesson is asking us to wait. Have you ever been in a situation where you were waiting for something? In our passage, it actually uses the word gift from God. Jesus, in his last resurrection appearance, before he ascends into heaven, is talking to his disciples, and he says, wait, wait until you receive power from on high, until you receive the gift that the Father is going to give you, that I've told you about, and that has been promised to you. So they wait. So that made me think, how are we with waiting? How are you with waiting? Has there been a time in your life where you had to wait for something that you basically knew was gonna be good, but you still had to wait? If you're a little one, think about Christmas. After you see all the presents under the tree and you still have to wait to go look at them. For the rest of us, when was a time when you had to wait? This automatically takes me back to the night before I got married. It's been a while, and yes, I can still remember. It's not been that long, and the gray cells were still functioning up, upstairs, so I could not sleep, which was not a good thing, because the wedding wasn't until like 7 o'clock in the evening on the next Saturday. I could not sleep. I was in a strange house, strange town, guest room, and my brother was in the next twin bed next for me, sound asleep, snoring up a storm. He was going to be my best man. And I was laying there absolutely waiting. What did my thoughts go to? Well, I was excited about getting here. I had believed with all my heart I had the right person and evidence of the, that has shown so far is going great, and I love it. But I was ready. I wanted what was coming. Now, here's the tricky part about this waiting. I really didn't know what I was 
really going to experience. We'll be married 36 years next July, in July. The 36 years that I've lived post wedding day, only part of them could I possibly have imagined. Last night, as we were putting our two eldest grandsons to bed, we're in hotel rooms in uh, Waco. Sam and Katie and the boys officially have a different room and then Trish and I have a, another room. But trying to get three little ones to sleep at the same time in the evening is not happening. So Trish and I had the little ones with us. We had them on the, well, I had one in the bed, Trish had another on the sofa bed, trying to keep them still, nice and quiet, waiting for them to go to sleep. When they fought, when one she had finally came as, fell asleep, she came over to where I was to let me know. She reached down to my ear and said, I am the richest woman in the world. The gift of this marriage and what has come from it because of the hand of God has blessed us beyond our ability to imagine. When we sent out our wedding invitations, we included the phrase, and that we would be dream makers three. We used the passage from Ecclesiastes that the cord of two strands is not easy, is easily, uh, three strands is not easily broken. The idea that God weaves us together. Our life journey as a couple has been because God has woven us together and has blessed us the whole way through. But we had no idea what dreams would come true when we were saying yes that first day or even when we, and I couldn't sleep the night before the wedding evening, what would come. Trish also mentioned to me that when she was in college, she found the scripture for the first time about a barren woman expanding her tents and having the blessing of children come to her. She received that prophetic word for her into her heart at about age 19 to give her hope. She didn't think she would have that experience as she leaned over last night to say that. She also remembered those passages. Indeed, when God comes in, when we give ourselves in our waiting to receive the gift that he has for us, the blessings go beyond anything we can ever imagine. That's true for our passage this morning as well. Our disciples, they have seen wonders beyond wonders, and yet more is still to come, more that they don't yet understand. This passage from Luke and Acts is the same event. Luke tells the story of the gospel in the gospel of Luke, it ends on this ascension day, and then Acts tells what happens as the Holy Spirit fills the church, calls forth the people, and sends the gospel out to all the world. It starts, basically, on Ascension Day. Ascension Day was last week, so we, some places recognize it last Sunday, some places recognize it this Sunday. So this is the Sunday we talked about Christ's ascension. But here's what's happened. So we can remember this. It was just a few short weeks ago. Christ died. After all of our hopes and dreams as disciples have been pinned on this amazing teacher, this person who could work miracles, the officials take over, the powers that be kill our hope, kill him, eliminate love, cancel out his teaching, and death takes over. Or so we think. So the disciples thought, third day, the tomb that was supposed to be locked away forever, that tomb that locks away our hope, that tomb of death that snarls in pride because it thinks it's one, that tomb was busted open by the power of God and out came our Lord in a resurrected body and he appeared again and again and again over the next 40 days to his disciples, teaching him how everything about the word of God from the beginning of Genesis onward has taught and prepared the 
people of God to know what this event was about. And on this day, he comes and he says to his disciples that they should wait while he was eating with them, it says in Acts, he gave this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They have heard him talk about this. When we look at the Gospels, we have seen ourselves him talk about this. But even spending three years with them, even seeing the power of the resurrection, even having conversations with the risen Lord, they are still not sure what the more the gift, the Holy Spirit is going to mean. Their very next question in Acts is, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They still are expecting the powers that be, the religious authorities, emperor of Rome governing them, the false king, the false governor, all that to be erased and a new kingdom to be set up in Jerusalem as its center for the people of God. But again, as we've said, this is not the point. When the Holy Spirit comes, we, they, are going to be filled with the power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and there's a purpose to this power. And it's not a purpose to take over because of power and rule with political or military or religious might. It's a different kind of power. It's the power of love. A love that is willing to sacrifice itself for another. So appropriate that we're talking about this today, Memorial Day. I like what Richard said in the Facebook post. He says, as we were talking about in our prayer to begin with, about those in the military and all the different branches who put themselves in harm's way and who have given the ultimate sacrifice. And then Richard, in his post, brings up first responders. And we think about them too, because we know first responders put their lives on the line for us without knowing who we are and are just willing to do that because of who they are in their heart. And we know, as Richard posted, no greater love has one than this, that they would lay down their life for their friends. Christ said that, thinking about what he would do, and then he also called his disciples, and through them, us, his friends. So we know that he laid down his life for us, but as he brought his life back, as God brought him back from the tomb, so are we promised to receive that eternal hope as well. And we are in this time of waiting, in this passage. However, I would challenge that we, listening and being a part of this, actually know what's coming next Sunday. Remind you, Pentecost, Pentecost is next Sunday. Pentecost, the 50th day after the Sabbath of Passover week, is another festival. And it was on that day that we'll talk about the Holy Spirit comes and these still timid and not yet sure what they think about all of this disciples take on a whole new identity and have a whole new sense of themselves and their purpose. But their purpose has already begun to be explained to them. If you look a little bit further, jumping, well actually if you look, jump back to the Luke passage, he tells them that they are to be his witnesses. We are witnesses of the truth of who Christ is in our lives and what he has done for us, what we know he's done for the world. And we have, through our willingness to share it, the opportunity to bring others in. Okay, so you all know, at least those who have worshiped on a regular basis in the sanctuary know um, I'm a big football fan. And I do basketball and I'm okay. And I actually do a little baseball when I have to. But what do we do now? We sit in misery with no sports. Well, my wife actually put the sports channel on, and of all things, NASCAR or some other kind of race was going. The goal was to get me to take a nap and put me to sleep. <laughs> it did pretty well. 
going round and round and round and round and round. And round. Okay, okay, never mind. Some of you may actually like NASCAR, and I am in an area where there's a lot of NASCAR fans, so I better be quiet. But as I was watching this, there was the end of the race came, and there was a victory. And then all of a sudden, the guy who won the race, it was just one of the days this week, and I think the race was on either yesterday or Thursday or something like that. The driver gets out, kneels beside his car, and prays. The news picks this up at, because he tweets out, blessing to God. The same week that he won this race, his wife had had a miscarriage. And the person that he beat by less than a second, his wife called the wife of the winner to comfort her because she had struggled with similar issues. And in his interviews and in his tweet, he said, I told my wife that I would race for her and race for our lost baby. And I said, I think God's gonna let me win because I think he wants me to use this for him. And he actually did that in his Twitter post and his interviews. He said that he was so emotional, God drove the car the last eight or nine laps. It wasn't him. And his Twitter post, as he grieved and celebrated both the loss of his child and the most successful day he'd ever had in his career as a race car driver, was to give power and honor and glory to God. Wow. We've talked recently that even when we suffer, God can provide purpose in the midst of that. We've been looking at the readings from 1 Peter, and we've worked all the way through, and we've come to the end. At the beginning of our reading, it said, since Christ suffered in his body, that we should arm ourselves with the same attitude. We are called to be those people. We've said it before in this first Peter, we've read the passage. We are a holy priesthood. We are the people who carry in our very being, not just knowledge of heaven, not just a philosophy that is a positive thing to live by. We carry the absolute truth, the Holy Spirit, the tangible presence of Christ in us. Literally, where we are, the kingdom is present through us because of who we are in Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. We even saw in the discussion a couple weeks ago about husbands and wives, in a very unusual way, Peter affirms that we, as husbands and wives, in a culture where this is a crazy thing to say, are co-heirs with the Lord Almighty in this power, in this hope, in this grace. So Peter says, have this same attitude. Have the attitude of Christ who was willing to lay down his life for others. Echo, think back to Philippians chapter 2. He, he who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself. We are called to be humble. We are called to let ourselves be used by God in any and every and all situations. I heard one person describe an interaction that a couple had had in their marriage where the husband had received an opportunity to take a job that was going to be a great job, both for the family and for God, because it had a ministry overtone. And the first response from the wife was, Oh, I can't stand the thought of living there. No way are we ever going to go there. End of discussion. If we were in the room, I'd be teasing a few of you husbands about remembering you've got to really listen to your wife. The husband prayed. He said, Lord, it looks good to me, but you have to convince her that it's a good thing for us. And then he didn't say anything else. He thought it was a done deal. She came back a few days later and said, now I had this interesting conversation with the Lord. Holy Spirit said to me, um, I'm not going to say a name, but who do you think you are? 
I am going to send you where I need you to be, and you know me, I'm going to take care of you. So she said, I can't tell you not to take that job. So they did. We each need that level of connection to the Holy Spirit, to God, in our hearts, in our minds. We need to pursue that. We need to know it. We need to live it so that in every circumstance, if he's got something we need to say or something we need to do or something that we've already said and done that's wrong, that he needs to change our heart, change our mind, we need to be attentive to that. So much of the time, we are stuck on our own sense of need, our own sense of priority, our own sense of wants. And he tells us we can't do that. We have to let go. Do not live. I'm looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2. Do not live the rest of the, we do not live the rest of our earthly lives for evil human desires, even less than evil. Just rather we live for the will of God. And he says to them, this is, this is describing what their life was like before in a pagan society. This is like code for they were pagans. They weren't Jews. These were folks who were outside the family of God completely. You have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans chose to do. And if this, these things, debauchery, lust, drunkenness, forging, carousing, detestable idolatry. The one that catches my idea is the detestable idolatry. There are so many things that we put in front of God. Chief of which is our own ego, our own wants, and our own needs. If we are going to walk this path, if we're going to pick up and even receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that this, this gift that God is offering to give us, we've got to let go of us. Christ suffered in the body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. We are done with sin. Not because we're perfect, but because we are in Christ. It's not our strength. We say yes to him. We let him fill us with his Holy Spirit. We let that Holy Spirit lead and guide and do the convicting in us. This doesn't mean condemnation. For some of us, that's actually a stumbling block. We are so self-condemning that we get in our own way because we think we can't do it because, hello, I'm not that good. That's not the issue. We set out in faith regardless. Okay, so let me give you a very tangible, because it's fresh on my mind, example of what it's like to try to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit in an impossible situation. Picture this. About five o'clock this morning, maybe a little bit after, everybody in the room that I'm in is asleep, everybody in the hotel is asleep, everybody in the kids, my son and daughter-in-law's room is asleep, and our middle grandson decides it's time to be awake. Has a wet diaper, has a wet bed, has energy galore. Take care of the diaper, take care of the bed, keep Trish and oldest grandson asleep. And now it's about 5.30, it's pitch black outside, and it's time to be quiet. You ever try to keep a three-year-old still and quiet? Let's say for two hours in the dark, while keeping your cool, let me tell you, it was an experience. I kept telling myself, I can't get mad. And I said, okay, Lord, I've got to be present to this little one as if you want me, the way you want me, with the attitude you want me, for his sake. And before it was all said and done, he was calm, never went back to sleep. So we had this long time, just be quiet, little whispers, He'd every once in a while put his hand on me. He'd every once in a while let me put my hand on him. It was just a very precious, quiet time. But I guarantee you, the first impulse was anger. The first impulse was to try to control. The first impulse was to say, I'm out of control of this situation. I've got to fix it. None of which was faithful. Nor would it have been helpful to him to create a power struggle. So it was just gentle coaching. Come on, Silas, you can do it. I know, it's hard to lay down. Come on, lay down. And we made it. 
so simple. And yet the picture in my head of what could have been was so catastrophic the other direction. But I actually did what I'm telling you about this morning. I let the Holy Spirit influence my thinking, influence my heart, control my adrenaline surge, and change my attitude. A little bit further down it says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. That is a constant reality in this world. And we are called to be constantly of sober mind and alert and ready to let the Holy Spirit lead us. Not just once in a while. Not when it's convenient. Not after we've gotten everything prepared. We are called to walk in that spirit all the time. So here we are. Officially, the disciples are still waiting for the Holy Spirit. But we know who the Holy Spirit is. Perhaps you are still waiting to understand it for yourself. Perhaps there is something that God is unfolding in your life to bring you into closer connection to him. At the end of the questions that I heard Cindy mention that you are going to be looking at, I asked you a few questions. So if you don't zoom in tomorrow night to that meeting, I encourage you to look at this uh, set of study questions anyway. What do you think God is preparing for you at this stage of your faith walk? Here's a news flash. None of us are done. God's not finished with us. He has purpose that is being renewed and has more for us, no matter where we are. No matter where we are, no matter what age we are, there is still something more as we give ourselves to God. The, the wait for the gift from God to be revealed to come and to receive it is still coming. Yes, we have it, but there's still more. What do you think God is preparing for you at this stage in your faith walk? That's not something anyone else can tell you. We can give you ideas. It's up to you to connect with God, to hear the answer. Second question, that there's some questions earlier, but this is at the end, just for, about your relationship with God. What is God doing in your heart, your mind, your spirit, to prepare you for the more that he wants for you? And how are you going to, how are you doing in yielding to his instruction? And the fourth one is what adjustment in your focus or priorities do you need to make to come into a deeper relationship with the Lord. So, you, right now, with your Lord, are in a conversation. It's not up to me to tell you or anyone else to tell you how this is to go. Listen, in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, what is he calling you to do today? What is he calling you to do in your relationship with him today? God has a gift for you. He has a gift for us. We have salvation. We have an assurance of what's coming in terms of eternal life with him. But he wants us to be his witnesses today. Witnesses who know and have something in their own life to share so that others can get to know him as well. You are my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the ends of the earth. We are part of those who are going to the ends of the earth, wherever you are going this week. I encourage you to take advantage of the time in this slowdown, shutdown. Yes, we are excited about what's coming, but we know right now God can talk to each one of us and show us something more about us and him. Let me pray for you and then I'll pass it back for singing. Lord, I would ask that as each one of us hear these words, that includes me, each one of us hear these words about the promise of your gift of something more, 
that you would both encourage us that that can be true about us and our life and our heart, and that you would help us to do what we need to do to open our hearts, our mind, to give time in our, in our calendar, give attention off the screens to the scriptures or music or meditation, whatever it is, Lord, that you could get our attention to teach us more about how to be who you need us to be. And then, Lord, help us to be bold in stepping out in faith, filled by you, ready to do what you need us to do on behalf of those around us. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And then, folks in the sanctuary, I invite you to lead us in some more singing. And I'll be back in a few minutes. God bless you all. Amen and amen. As we sing, I will follow, inspired by the book of Ruth. Beloved, let's pray a prayer of dedication. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that we are yours, that you are ours and we are yours. And so, Father, we choose to follow you. We were made in your image, God. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Mold us and make us every day into more of who you are, Jesus. We want to be like you. Father, we just love you. We're so thankful, God. We're so thankful that you love us with an everlasting love. And nothing can separate us from your love. So, Lord, give us a hunger to make that connection with you. To open ourselves up and say, yes, Holy Spirit, have your way in me, through me. We are your witnesses, God, for such a time as this. Lord, take us and use us. 
mold us, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your blood. You bought us. We're not our own. Lord, let us truly live for you for such a time as this, God. So, Lord, here we are. We're yours. We give ourselves to you totally and completely, our bodies, our minds, our souls. Use us this week, God, to glorify you. And bless, bless each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing worship in Christ alone. <laughs>
Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good day. Go in peace.